Islam and the Future of Tolerance, a dialogue, is a collaboration between that famous atheist Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz, a one-time radical with his book Tahrir, who went on to found the anti-extremist think tank Quilliam Foundation. Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz joined me earlier from Los Angeles and Washington. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Thank you, Tony. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Sam Harris, first to you. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things about your dialogue with Majid is that you, the famous atheist, refuse to question his belief. So what is the purpose of the dialogue? Well, it's really to find a, a pragmatic strategy for moving forward. I think we both recognize that there's really an excruciating problem both within the, the Muslim world, you know, with the Muslim community worldwide, and within... Uh, open civil society in speaking uh, uh, about this problem. And so we're dealing with really a failure of conversation about how to engineer a spirit and program of reform within Islam. And uh, it, 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 there's a, this problem is immense and, and many layered. And, uh, you know, one impediment to remove at the outset is to, uh, uh, from, from my side, to not try to engage the debate about atheism versus religion or re reason versus faith because uh, you know I've had that debate more or less ad nauseum in other contexts and I'm not, under no illusions that I or anyone else is going to convince 1.6 billion Muslims to become atheists uh, certainly not in any time frame uh, that is uh, coincides with with a single lifetime so the, the, pr the, the challenge really is to find uh, moderating voices who can credibly sketch a path toward reform where we can have a real spirit of secularism and liberalism within the Muslim community. Uh, Majid Nawaz, uh, what is important about this dialogue from your point of view? I'd like to make two points, Tony. First of all, um, I think Sam's absolutely correct. The, it's a second-order question for both Sam and me as to what his beliefs are and what my beliefs are. And the reason that is, is of course that the, the intellectual battle lines have been drawn not along uh, the belief or the metaphysical belief uh, uh, basis. Uh, so, you know, there are atheists who are on the side of the Islamists defending, I call them the regressive left, defending Islamism and defending regressive values in the name of cultural tolerance. So the issue isn't whether one is an atheist or a believer. The issue is whether one subscribes to the universality of human rights, liberal, secular, democratic values. Uh, and, and that's where Sam and I agree, and that's the way forward, uh, less so about what I call the second-order question about one's metaphysical beliefs. The second point I'd like to make is that actually, uh, for, for my atheist friends out there, who often say that it's incredibly unrealistic to believe that Islam can be reformed uh, in this day and age, what I'd say is actually it's even more unrealistic to believe that, uh, as Sam said, that 1.6 billion Muslims are going to magically somehow overnight apostatize. So the only realistic, pragmatic, uh, and intellectually sound way forward is for all of us to unite around secular, uh, liberal, human rights, democratic values, and believe in their universality, and call for them, whether we're calling for them to be applied upon non-Muslim, white men or brown Muslim uh, people. Uh, these values apply to everyone equally. Uh, Sam Harris, um, let's go to one of the first points that uh, Majid made there, and it picks up on one of your main gripes with your left liberal critics who you accuse of being led over a cliff by Noam Chomsky. Tell us what you mean. There's a kernel of truth to what Chomsky says about the missteps of, of the U.S. And, and other Western powers. Uh, we have not created this phenomenon of global jihad. Uh, there, this is a, a phenomenon that, that is uh, on some level over a thousand years old and, and now we're dealing with the modern <clears throat> variant of it. But w what we have to recognize is that there are specific ideologies that are uh, delivering us what we're calling Islamism and jihadism here. And until, those, until we win a, w a war of ideas against these ideologies, a belief in martyrdom, a belief in paradise, uh, uh, we, we are going to continue to confront this uh, evil, a kind of evil which should really be unimaginable in the year 2015. Uh, Majid, um, can you uh, talk to us about the reluctance uh, of many to actually have this debate openly and to talk clearly about what may or may not be wrong in Islamic teachings? And uh, in terms of what happened in Britain, you talk about the Voldemort effect. What do you mean by that? Yes, for anyone who's read uh, the Harry Potter series of books, they'll understand that the evil uh, man, the baddie in those books, is a man named uh, Voldemort. Now, the, the problem in those books, of course, is that 
Harry is one of the only people that's able to both uh, name uh, this evil person by name and also uh, insist that, that, that the person exists and isn't dead. The rest of the community, the wizarding community, uh, are, are, are unable to do those two things. They are so petrified, so scared of this evil that they're unable to name it. In fact, they also insist that the evil doesn't exist. Now, I drew an analogy from that to talk about Islamism, the ideology that I briefly define in one sentence as the desire to impose any version of Islam over society. Now, for me, that's an inherently theocratic tendency, and theocracies have absolutely no place in this modern day and age. So when we're dealing with the challenge that faces us, which I call Islamism, if we get to a situation where the President of the United States of America cannot even bring himself to name this ideology, we cannot even begin to tackle it. So what we've been doing, and of course you may, your viewers will be able to tell from my accent, I'm from London, what we've been doing uh, with the British government and with the Prime Minister there is focusing on getting the British uh, government and the Prime Minister to recognize that there is an ideology. This ideology is called Islamism. It needs to be isolated from whichever interpretation of Islam Muslims may happen to subscribe to, and then it needs to be challenged because we are indeed engaged in an ideological war. And the PM, Cameron, has actually done that, and, and I think it's about time that the American president did the same too. Sam Harris, um, do you see something distinct in the nature of Islam as opposed to other religions that gives rise to the particular brand of brutality uh, practiced by the adherents of Islamic State? Yeah, I do. I do. Unfortunately, I do. That, both theologically and, and as a matter of just uh, historical accident. I mean, as a matter of history, Islam has not had a, a proper collision with modernity and, and secularism and science uh, the way Christianity has. So Christianity over the course of centuries really has been humbled by, by secular politics and uh, a much larger ethical and political conversation about how we all should live together. And its, it's pretensions to govern all of the concerns of humanity have really been beaten back, uh, and that's all to the good. Uh, so, so that is one difference. Islam has been isolated from these trends and, and now is, is, I think, quite shocked to suddenly find itself trying to live in a, in a global, a truly global and pluralistic world. Uh, but there are theological differences between Islam and Christianity and, and Judaism and other faiths that uh, I think make Islam more difficult to reform. Now, that doesn't change the project uh, before us, which is we have to find some way to carve out a genuine respect for secularism and liberalism and tolerance and a respect for free speech above all uh, within the Muslim world. And we have to find a, a theological basis that's credible f by which Muslims can repudiate this creeping theocracy of Islamism. But it, it, is, it is a challenge, and I, and I would argue and have argued, I argue to some degree in my book with Majid and elsewhere that, that it's a challenge that is uh, particularly difficult for Islam. Uh, Sam, uh, briefly on specifics, you maintain pretty much that everything a jihadist needs to justify their beliefs and their actions can be spelled out unambiguously in the Quran and the Hadith. Um, give us just a, a quick sense of that and I'll throw to Majid to get his response. Yeah, and I would add to that the, the biography of Muhammad. I, 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 it's simple to, to describe this way, unfortunately. If you ask the question, what is ISIS doing, ISIS being the, the, the or the Islamic State being the worst case now of, of um, uh, jihad, jihadism run amok, what is ISIS doing that Muhammad didn't do or wouldn't have approved of? Uh, that is actually a, uh, unfortunately, not the easiest question to answer. And uh, the, the example of Muhammad is, uh, you know, as, as just an exemplar of the faith, um, is, uh, doesn't square very well with modern, cosmopolitan, secular, tolerant values. He was not a hippie who got crucified. He was not a, um, a meditator, who, an ascetic, who sat cross-legged under a Bodhi tree. Uh, he was a, a warlord who did many of the things that, uh, that you see uh, uh, members of ISIS doing, and that's why they can kind of paint by numbers and justify what they're doing with a very literalist and, as Majid would say, a vacuous reading of uh, uh, Islamic theology. And that's a, a, a very inconvenient fact, which we have to confront head-on and find some way to 
disavow the intolerant readings of these passages in, in Scripture. Okay, uh, Majid, do you agree that this is an inconvenient truth about Islam, about Muhammad? Yeah, see, what I say in my dialogue with Sam in this book is that the Islamists, those who want to impose a version of Islam over society, and the jihadists, those who use force to bring about Islamism, have a plausible reading of Scripture. It's incorrect for we, as Muslims, and generally, actually, I'd say, those on the left of center in this debate, to insist that Islamists and jihadists have nothing to do with Islam. That's actually an, uh, that's actually an exercise in dishonesty. Of course, they have something to do with, do with Islam. I, I would argue it's equally incorrect to say that they are Islam per se, because, of course, I'm a Muslim, and I'm not ISIS, I'm not an Islamist. Uh, and so I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. And that is that they have something to do with Islam. And the something there is that they are using certain passages in the scripture, as Sam correctly mentioned. Uh, there are passages in the scripture that they can resort to. So they have a plausible reading of scripture. The challenge, and I, this is more a plea uh, that I make here on, on your show, to my fellow Muslims in Australia. And that is that we, as Muslims, have a task ahead of us, a monumentous task ahead of us. And that is to begin the process of adapting of reinterpreting our scriptures for the modern day and age. Now, uh, you know, I think the task ahead of us is summarized best in one sentence, and that is that, that, that Islamism, this ideology I refer to, must be intellectually terminated. Whereas Islam, the religion, uh, simply must be reformed to adjust to modernity, and that's something we've had for centuries, known by Muslims as the process of ijtihad, or reinterpretation of the scripture. The scripture itself can cater for that process, unfortunately, Many Muslims today, instead of uh, rising to that challenge, are, are incredibly defensive when it comes to this. Sam Harris, um, of course, this still leaves us with confronting the world, in fact, with confronting the virulence of jihadism that's already taken root. And you use in the dialogue, mm. or use the dialogue to confront one of the worst forms of depravity. One in particular stays in my mind. It was a Taliban attack on a school in Peshawar, Pakistan, where 132 <coughs> children were murdered for which the jihadists gave a very grim justification. Uh, first of all, just set out what that justification is and we'll move on. Uh, yeah, well, this was a discussion with a, a Taliban supporter who, after this, this massacre at the school in Peshawar, uh, justified it to a friend of ours, Ali A. Rizvi, a, a, a ex-Muslim online. And he said, you don't understand. You, you're a materialist. You think death is the end of everything. And so this is why you think something bad happened here. But those children are, are in paradise. We did them a favor. And the last thing they heard was Allahu Akbar, and, this, and they will be at the right hand of God. Uh, and the, and uh, what you see in this justification, and I, I've been worrying about this for years, is that a, a sincere belief in paradise really takes the, the guardrails off of civilization. I mean, if, if you become undeterrable by death, and you think that it's impossible to kill the wrong people, because if you blow up a crowd of even Muslim children as a Muslim, well, you've sent the children to paradise, and you've sent all the bad people to hell, which is where God wants them. So you've done, you, you, it's impossible to, to kill the wrong people. It's impossible for anything to go wrong. And this world is just fit to be destroyed, because there's nothing about it that matters in light of eternity. Um, now, there are obviously other religions that have this, this a, a problematic conception of paradise, in particular Christianity. But uh, it, within Islam, it's married to a notion of martyrdom and a notion of jihad in defense of the faith that, that I, I think really is, is um, almost the perfect recipe for the kind of death cult behavior we're seeing in, in the Muslim world. Majid, can I get you to respond to that? And uh, can you do it from the uh, point of view of, I'll pose this question, how should the world confront evil of that magnitude? Because even if you are able to reform uh, the intelligent, um, sensitive uh, side of people's minds, you're still going to have to confront ISIS. Yes, absolutely. And we've been advocating in the United Kingdom a what we call a full spectrum approach to this, a whole of society approach. And I draw the analogy, and we've given advice to the British government by using such analogies, uh, that if you consider the question of racism, if you consider the issue of homophobia and anti-Semitism, full-on civil society campaigns have, within my own lifetime, within one generation, turned these debates around to a point where if you ask me at 15 years old if I would ever imagine an African-American president of the United States, I would have laughed you out of the room. But that's something we've seen within our own lifetime. 
lifetime. In the United Kingdom, we have a Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, who has introduced gay marriage equality laws whilst he's serving as Prime Minister. Yet I grew up under Margaret Thatcher, and again, I would have walked you, I would have laughed you out of the room if you asked me whether that would be possible under a Conservative Prime Minister. So we've arrived at a situation where in the issues, in the debates around racism and homophobia, uh, these have actually really been turned around. So what we uh, argue is that likewise for Islamism, we need a full spectrum civil society approach to challenge this, not to shy away from it, to, uh, to break away from this Voldemort effect, the taboo of not being able to name the ideology for what it is, and then to actually employ or deploy uh, all of the institutions within society. So whether that be the schools, whether that be uh, the media, whether that be uh, p politicians, civil society campaigners, all to start challenging and calling out Islamist theocratic tendencies wherever they see them. Now that full spectrum approach will also include, where necessary, uh, a military uh, approach. So of course ISIS is waging war on, on, on civilization and it needs to be met with force where necessary. So uh, we're, not, we're not restricting uh, any other approach, whether it be military or legal, but what we're saying is what's been missing up until now, uh, because of course there's been plenty of war and there have been plenty of laws, what's been missing up until now has been the recognition that this is actually an ideas war, this is a civil society campaign, and Islamism needs to be named and shamed. And it's not just Muslims who are responsible, by the way, for doing this. All of society, as was with racism, as was with homophobia, because all of society is affected by this, everyone's responsible for, for, for taking on this challenge. But that, that includes Muslims as well, and unfortunately, uh, many of my fellow Muslims are a bit defensive these days when it comes to facing this challenge. And Majid, that still leaves us with the problem of Syria and uh, northern Iraq and well, particularly Syria at the moment. And uh, you, you mentioned military intervention, but I understand from the dialogue that you actually would oppose a kind of Western-led military intervention into Syria. But can you see a Muslim army trying to stop ISIS? It's just not going to happen, is it? Well, I, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle there. I don't oppose airstrikes. What I oppose is putting boots on the ground, whether American, British or Australian or any, any Western boots on the ground, because I think what that does is it provides ISIS with a perfect opportunity to galvanize even more recruits from across the world. What I argue is it's the responsibility of the Arab regimes and the Turkish government next door to step up to this challenge and actually to take responsibility for policing their own backyard. And unfortunately, they haven't been doing that too well. Uh, up until today and, and, and in fact it's like you know you can't have your cake, it, cake and eat it too. On the one hand these governments and these societies complain when Western regimes uh, uh, invade or intervene and yet on the other hand when nothing's done they also complain. Well actually I think it's a bit it's, it's, it's high time that they took responsibility for some of this. Right. What we really need is an Arab Sunni force to challenge ISIS and America though by the way needs to lead in organizing uh, and galvanizing that coalition okay. but there needs to be Arab Sunni troops on the ground. But we're, 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 we're sort of drawing towards an end but I'm going to bring Sam Harris in to respond to that. The problem in Syria is profound. The expansion of ISIS or Islamic State across um, not only states but continents is continuing. What do you think is the answer there? Well, I, I think we just have to keep the big picture in view because locally, yes, it's, it's uh, easy to see or it's not easy to see that there's a solution uh, that is is going to come anytime soon to the to the civil war in Syria. I mean, there are many uh, many pieces in play there, um, and uh, I agree that uh, American or British or other infidel boots on the ground there is so provocative, uh, and is do essentially doing the public re relations of, of ISIS for them uh, that uh, you, know, you you want to avoid that if at all possible. But we we need to recognize that we are inching our way towards a global civil society and that free speech simply has to win and that self-censorship that we have have all practiced after the the Danish cartoon controversy or even before after Salman Rushdie's of uh, satanic verses um, a kind of self-censorship that has been urged upon us by uh, liberals for the most part uh, on the one hand but then also you know other our own religious demagogues who are worried about their own cases of blasphemy on the other uh, that's it's a dead end that it's a, it's a cul-de-sac ethically and politically that we have to find our way out of and we have to treat uh, the Muslim community worldwide as adults who have to uh, tolerate satire and have to tolerate free speech and have to tolerate uh, pluralism and human rights and we have to oblige them with every tool at our disposal whether it's economic or whether it's military or whether it's a matter of police enforcement or it depends what, at what level of society we're encountering this problem but that th these principles have to be non-negotiable and uh, we we 
really are not even at the starting line in, in our liberal discourse about this. And uh, that's what uh, uh, my, my collaboration with Majid is, is hoping to kindle in us, a, a, an understanding of, of what the first step forward is. Okay, uh, Majid, a final thought. What happens if the reformist Islam that you and a relatively few others are promoting is simply ignored? Um, could we be heading for a genuine clash of civilizations, to use that hackneyed term? Well, I think this is a clash within civilization. I mean, there are Arab Democrats, there are secular liberal Arabs. We saw them overthrow the Muslim Brother Brotherhood government in Egypt. In, in what was the, the country's largest protest in its history. So it's a clash within civilizations. There are Muslims and non-Muslims. In fact, we began the interview on this point. There are Muslims, non-Muslims, atheists, theists on the liberal, secular, universal side of this debate. And there are atheists, Islamists, and all forms of regressive leftists on the authoritarian or, uh, you know, fellow travelers to theocrat side of this debate. And actually, they are the dividing lines. Uh, to answer your question, I don't think there's an option. This cannot fail. Um, in fact, Islamism, when implemented, without exception, leads to nothing but misery, leads to nothing but darkness and gloom over those societies upon which it's implemented. And eventually, people do want their own freedom and they want their own uh, choices to make for themselves. So actually, I think this is the only way forward. It's just it's going to take us a while to get there. It's inevitable that religions go through this form of reform process. The reason when people ask is, you know, where is Islam's reformation, to put aside the, you know, the problems with using that exact phrase because that's histori historical context. But, you know, people ask, where is the, the reform of Islam today? And I say to them, well, actually, what we see with ISIS, what we see going on around the world, we're in the thick of it. We can't see the wood for the trees because we're in the middle of it. But I believe that, this, that, that there is an absolutely no other choice but for, but for us to actually get through this and to continue this uh, process of reform. But it does require people to speak out. Gentlemen, it's a profound uh, discussion, and uh, we thank you for uh, joining us to uh, continue it here. Sam Harris, Majid Nawaz, thanks to both of you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.